Okay, so let's look at our first poem then. Um, and that is on page 17, right? And I have a top of page 17, a simple title that says War Poetry. Remember I said, if we're gonna reduce our poems from say 16 to three, what three poems do we pick for the exams? Try and pick three that are, you know, from totally different themes, sort of, so we spread it out depending on what comes up in the exam. So war is, is, is quite a common uh, and popular theme for study at junior cycle. So let's, let's do one of those today. I've tried to pick one that's very popular that I'm thinking a lot of junior cycle students do, which is called Dulce et Decorum Est which is a uh, Latin phrase, right? It's written by Wilfred Owen, okay? Um, so we talked about, on the, in the notes on page 15, it says six things that you should sort of gather some knowledge about, some notes about uh, for each of these poems. Um, and if you look at 16, the things were poetic techniques, theme, setting, tone, meaning, and imagery. They're not in any particular order. They're not important to least important or anything like that. So don't just, you need, you need to be able to say a little something about each of those. So they're the, the six things we need to get notes on, but then you also need to, to know quotation as well. And if I'm narrowing my poems down to just three poems, then I'm gonna learn quite a lot of quotes from each of the po uh, poems, okay? If you had 16 poems, I might say just learn two or three quotes from each poem, because you know, 16 threes is, a lot, uh, 40 something, <laughs> eight, okay. Um, but if, um, seeing as we're narrowing it down to th just three poems, well look, let's try and learn, I'd be saying eight, nine, 10 uh, quotes from, from the poems, right? And always be, what quotes should you learn? Quotes that jump out at you, absolutely. Quotes that the teacher says are important, absolutely. But quotes that um, have a strong image or a language technique in them. So if there's a nice simile or a nice metaphor or something that just jumps out at you because of the image that it creates in your mind, they're the quotes to go for, okay? So we'll look at this poem here, um, Dulce et Decorum S. I unfortunately don't have much time. We've about 15 minutes left. So I'm instead of, I, I would love to just read it down through and then read it again and read it the third time. But we don't have time because we're just really looking at how we maybe pick apart a poem. So I'll break it down verse by verse, okay? Um, bit of background, just in case you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, I haven't done this poem. It's a great poem. It's quite a visual graphic poem, quite a vicious poem and what it's, it's subject matter. It's talking about war and it describes one soldier's vicious death after he breathes in this poisonous gas. Gas And the overall idea in the poem is to try and show war up to be what it is. Sort of vicious, cruel, futile, useless uh, thing that just causes death and destruction and um, sadness, essentially. Okay, And Wilfred Owen, he, he experiences this firsthand. He, he's a soldier in the war. A uh, funny story about Owen is, and not so, so funny for Owen, uh, I should say, is that he fights for a couple of years out in the Western Front in World War I, and uh, he, he gets some, takes some shrapnel uh, in a battle, and he's sent home to recover. He's an injury in his leg, and he's sent home to recover, and he goes back out to the front three months before the war finishes and he's, he's killed, unfortunately, on the front. Uh, yeah, I did say funny earlier on. Uh, it's actually not that funny at all. Interesting, let's go with that word. Uh, okay, first verse. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks, not need, coughing like hags, we curse through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and toward our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep, many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, Drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of the tired, outstripped five nines that lie behind, or that drop behind. So, it's a description of soldiers making their way home. It's quite graphic. There's lots of good language techniques. Could you pick out a few language techniques that kind of create good images there for me? I'm thinking about the similes. Any, any ideas there? Look, line one, bent double like old beggars under sacks. We were like old beggars, kind of getting weighed down by carrying our kind of life's belongings on our backs, right? Um, verse, or sorry, line two, coughing like hags. A hag is a sort of witch sort of, uh, type uh, female, okay? So we're coughing like old hags, basically, because of the, you know, 
the uh, you know the smoke and the uh, residue from the battlefield getting into their respiratory system right into their lungs and um, what else there are other it, so there are two good similes in the first I like there's a nice metaphor there in the second last line drunk with fatigue okay have you ever seen a drunk person walking down the street they don't walk in straight lines sure they don't they kind of walk wobble this way and that that's the way the men were walking as well they were drunk with fatigue not drunk with alcohol as you'd associate with the word drunk drunk with fatigue fatigue means tiredness so these soldiers are so tired they can't even walk straight and there's loads of other little images um, men marched to sleep again men marched what language technique is that mm the use of two consonants close to each other at the start of words alliteration isn't it okay um, yeah, and, and I, I like the use of the repetition in the sixth line, all went lame, all blind, okay? And that's another language technique which maybe you know, it's called uh, hyperbole, you know, sort of exaggerated language, because not everyone was blind and not everyone was lame. It's just describing that everyone was suffering, you know, from maybe their eyes were stinging and maybe everyone was so tired that they were kind of walking a bit slower, but they weren't actually blind, you know? So that's exaggerated language, it's called hyperbole and that's a good uh, uh, technique as well. So it, it sets the scene. If you're talking about setting, thinking about the notes that we should be taking about setting, absolutely sets the, the scene there. Uh, second verse is the attack right there's attack an attack here on these soldiers and that's what the second verse describes i'll read it gas gas quick boys an ecstasy of fumbling fitting the clumsy helmets just in time but someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime uh, dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea i saw him drowning in all my dreams before my helpless slight he plunges at me guttering choking drowning love the onomatopoeia there in that last um few words choking guttering that's onomatopoeia you know the noises that their chests were making so let's mark that in no underline and write o n o beside it you don't need to write the full word o n o is fine um another powerful line for me in that is the fourth line floundering like a man in fire or lime lime is not lime the fruit lime is lime the chemical and it's an acid really it burns so this man who breathes in this gas is floundering it's a good verb to flounder would be to you know to wave your hands madly and um, you know because of panic so this man it, who's breathed in this gas what happens here gas attack he doesn't get his mask on in time so he breathes in the poisonous air and it's like he's been set on fire or it's like someone's thrown acid on him that's what that simile means floundering like a man in fire or lime it's a very strong image of a man in pure hysterical panic because he knows the gas is in his lungs and it's bloody painful right and um, and he says in the sixth line there i saw him drowning that's what happens your lungs would fill up with liquid from breathing in this gas the chemical reaction so it's a very graphic visual horrible image of how this poor man dies okay and the last verse if in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in they didn't put him carefully in. he was flung in just another dead soldier so mark that verb and watch the white eyes writhing in his face his hanging face like a devil sick of sin like a devil's sick of sin what's that language technique comparing the man's face to a devil's face because of what he's been through he's, it's all red and blotchy and um, simile isn't it like a devil's sick of sin if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs gargling is a powerful word isn't it gargling is onomatopoeia right let's underline it and write o n o beside it obscene as cancer bitter as the could two two powerful similes there it was obscene as cancer as disgusting as cancer watching this man die bitter as the could a vile incurable sores on innocent tongues my friend you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie and this is the point of the poem dulce et decorum es pro patria mori means what does the title mean it is sweet and honorable right and pro patria mori the added bit there means to die for your country this was an old recruiting slogan that they used back in world war one it's honorable be a man go on because men were the, the women didn't 
you know, join the army in those days. It was men and be a man, join the army, go and fight for your country. It's, a, it's, a, it's the right thing to do. And Owen is trying to say, that's a lie. The old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, the old lie that it's sweet and honorable to die for your country, not true. Look at the way this guy died. And look at that last verse. His body is flung into a wagon and his eyes are bulging out of his head. The white eyes writhing in his face. Do you see that third line in the, the, the last stanza? Watch the white eyes writhing. WWW. Alliteration, okay? The repetition of that consonant is alliteration. And you've got images of the comparing his face to a devil's, that nice simile there, the noise that his lungs were making after he died, the sort of frothing, sort of gargling noise. It's really disturbing, isn't it? So Owen is saying there is absolutely not one thing honourable or sweet, dulce et decorum est. There's nothing sweet or honourable about the way this guy and millions like him died during the war. So this essentially is an anti-war poem. This is Owen saying, look, it's lies. What they're telling you is lies. There's nothing sweet, there's nothing honorable. Uh, people are getting butchered in their millions and then their bodies are flung on a, a wagon and you know that's the end of it. So he's making a point against it. So they're the types of things that we'd be picking out. Those strong images, those strong language techniques like simile, metaphor, onomatopoeia, alliteration, um, the lines that jump out at me. And I would be trying to make the notes on, um, as it says on page 15, poetic techniques, um, theme, setting, tone, meaning, imagery. The only thing we haven't said uh, anything about there is tone. What do you think the tone of the speaker in this po poem is? Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they angry? Uh, are they frustrated? Maybe it's a mixture of a few things. I think the speaker, which is Owen, I think, you know, in one way he's frustrated because it's a lie, it's the old lie. There's nothing right about what's going on over in France and Belgium is what he's trying to say during World War I. By the way, if I didn't say that, it's set during World War I, 1914 to 1918. So, um, yeah, maybe that, that's um, in terms of the tone. It's angry and it's frustrated. Let's, the last thing we'll do today is page 18. Uh, we're going to look at a sample. What would a junior cycle sample answer look like? Okay, and you see it on page 18. The question said it was 20 marks, right? So if we're using our three minute rule from earlier on, 20 marks divided by five, 20 divided by five is four, four by three is 12 minutes. For every five marks, three minutes. So you'd have 12 minutes to do this answer, right? To write about, I would equate it to, for every five marks, you want to write one paragraph, okay? So if it's 20 marks, I'm gonna write four paragraphs. That's the way I break it down. And I've got 12 minutes to do that. And the paragraphs don't need to be long, okay? Par junior cycle paragraphs, you can have five, six, seven lines. That's all you need. PQE, make a point, give a quote, and explain your quotation by maybe picking out any of these things, language techniques or parts of speech or just in your own words. Okay, so discuss a poem on your course that had a lasting impression on you, explain why it is memorable and the devices, techniques, the devices the poet used to help it have a lasting impression. So a poem that's memorable. Now that could be any, if you've done three poems, uh, if, sorry, if you've, if you've picked three poems for Junior Cycle, you could pick anyone and argue that it's memorable to me for whatever the reasons. This one's quite a memorable poem, you know, because of the harrowing details of what happens to the poor man in the poem, all right? Um, so, very quickly, okay, because I'm sort of running out of time here, um, we'll just read the answer and pick out one or two things along the way. I've written five paragraphs, four will be absolutely fine. The poem details the events of a young soldier's death in World War I. Owen focuses in on a man's suffering in order to paint a picture of the futility and destruction of war and why it is very, and this is why it's very memorable. So that's like an introductory paragraph. I, you know, if you've time, put it in, but I would generally just get straight into the uh, nut, uh, you know, nuts and bolts of the answer. So the first verse tells us how tired and beaten the soldiers were. Quote, men marched to sleep. Owen uses alliteration to emphasize the idea of soldiers sleepwalking because they were so completely fatigued. Now look, that is a very simple example of making a point, giving a quote, and explaining it briefly. And it's a short paragraph. You know, your paragraphs don't always need to be gigantic. Paragraph two, next one. The second stanza depicts, which means shows, a gas attack as one unlucky soldier fails to get his mask off on in time. The powerful simile, so well done for spotting simile, like a man in fire or lime, tells us how painful it is to breathe in this poisonous gas. 
The tortured man's body is flung in a wagon. See the way I just use one word there for to get my quote in? That's fine as well. This verb is very powerful and shows the utter disrespect for the corpse. I think the poem is so memorable because Owen realises there's nothing sweet or honourable about the way this person died. Two more paragraphs here, very quickly. Obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud. So I start the paragraph with the quote, that's absolutely fine. Now I need to just make my point and explain. Owen's use of clever simile, again, I've identified the language technique, continues towards the poem's conclusion. And in one of the main reasons that this piece, sorry, one of the main reasons that this piece is so memorable. Keep going back to the key words of the question, memorable. Comparing the man suffering to a brutal disease that we can all relate to is clever. The adjective bitter also graphically depicts the putrid substance in the dead man's lungs. Parts of speech, remember? The adjective bitter, right? Um, and helps the reader grasp the barbarity of this poor soldier's situation. And the very last paragraph, Owen is trying to show the average person that the title of the poem and a famous soldier recruiting slogan of the time, Dulcet Cormes, is a, quote, lie. One word, fine. Capitalization of this word, lie, helps highlight Owen's sentiments and shows there is nothing honourable or sweet about the way this man perished. These are the reasons why Dulcet Cormes has a lasting impression on me. Again, back to the key words of the question in every paragraph. Lasting impression, lasting impression, all the way through. Okay, and that's a good example of a, a junior cycle a standard answer. Good answer, should we say. So that's, that brings us toward, uh, to the end of the, of the um, back to school course. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed some of the concepts I went through, like the key terms for junior cycle and the course intro and the topic of poetry, which I just touched on briefly, just one class. Um, obviously, I go into much greater detail in the weekly classes during the year and um, so i hope you've got some benefit for that and gives you a little bit of a refresher and a head start going back into next uh, next year going into third year i wish you the very best of luck and uh, maybe i'll see you soon take care bye